Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the, uh, what is it, the three o'clock block uh, here in Hawaii, Um And we have a special show with Kirby Wright, who joins us from California by remote. Hi, hi, Kirby. Aloha. How are you doing, Jay? Good. Yeah. So I understand you're a, uh, an author and you've written a book, a nonfiction book about a, yeah. a story dear to your, your heart and probably dear to the hearts of uh, everybody in Hawaii about your mother. Uh, my grandmother. Grandmother, grandmother. Grand pardon me. I don't want to make you know. I don't make you older than you are. You are okay. the son of Harold Wright, who was one of the founders of the Cage Shuddy firm, which we all know on Bishop Street. Um, you got it. And you're living in California. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you right now? I'm right now in a inland town away from the coast called Vista, California. Vista. Okay. Vista. Now, yeah. I'm joining Vista. us. Joining us by the VMix call. And we want to talk about your book, which you which you called uh, "The Queen of Molokai," referring to your your grandmother, who I guess uh, came here uh, in uh, 1916 when she was 15 years old. And the no, book no, she was she was born here, born and raised here. Ah, okay. I we got see. Hawaiian blood. Yeah, we got Hawaiian blood. Goes back to my great great grandmother, pure Hawaiian from uh -huh. Maui. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Well, why don't you? Uh, First, tell us the reasons that you wrote this book about your grandmother and the Queen of Molokai. Well, you know, Jay, the feeling that I got was I'm not getting any younger. And I wanted, she was, she meant a lot to me, my grandmother. And I wanted to capture her story. I wanted to document her life story and not let that slip away. And I kind of wanted to use that book as an example for other writers or would-be writers in Hawaii to document their elders' stories before it's too late. It was almost too late for me. And the idea came from my wife, Darcy. I was gnashing my teeth wondering what to write. I was writing futuristic books, and they weren't that fulfilling. She said, duh. Write about your grandmother because she had a very interesting life story. And this, this is a woman that really was a very spoiled and ran the streets of Waikiki and was boy crazy and uh, was infatuated with one of the uh, uh, founding members of the Outrigger Canoe Club. And the only thing is he was older than her and he married a, a local gal and she kind of was uh you know and gone with the wind when the woman at the end says you know i don't care as god is my witness i'll get that guy back well that's what she did but he he let he left the islands to go he volunteered for the war and his, his name was chipper gilman one of the founding members of the outrigger and he was um he joined alexander hume ford who was the founding father of the outrigger and he he felt that it was his duty, even though we were a territory of Hawaii, to go over to France. And what he did was interesting. He had a Harley Davidson. They gave him a Harley, and they had him relay messages from the uh, the brass to the front lines in France. And he had a run in with Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway saw the Harley and said, "You know what? I I want to." use your Harley to rescue injured Americans that are in the front. And he says, well, how am I going to get those messages to the front line? And they actually had a fight. They had a boxing match in France, and they duped it out. And my uncle won that fight. And he's a, he has a very interesting past because his brother, believe it or not, was the first football All-American from Hawaii. Oh, interesting. From Harvard. He was a Harvard, I believe he was a linebacker, and he excelled. He got this, you know, he was he was all American, 1915. And Harvard says, We got a little come in to talk to the dean. He came out to talk to the dean, and they said, We like your performance in the field, but you've been expelled because you're you're flunking out of all your classes. <laughs> <laughs> How did you oh, get yeah. this information? You know, uh, Kirby, this is uh, this is information that may not be easy to get because it's embarrassing sometimes for the people involved, no? Oh, yeah, but I mean, you know, I'm I'm the kind of writer, if I'm telling a true story, I I, I don't candy coat anything. I, I tell the truth. And 
It's a very, you know, they're comparing the book. Uh, some of the early critics are comparing it to Pat Conroy with Prince of Tides. And they also say it's similar to Angela's Ashes with Frank McCourt because of women overcoming great hardship. And by hardship, I mean my grandmother ran the streets wild at 16 and got pregnant with two boys from two very different men out of wedlock, and she was only 18. <laughs> So um, who did you talk to to develop this, um, you know, this oral history that you wrote down? Well, I spent every summer with my grandmother on the island of Molokai because my brother and I would fight all the time. We're only a year apart. They call us Irish twins. And my father would send it up, us up to harden us to be with grandmother's, under grandmother's supervision. And I was the type of guy who liked to just hang out with her and hear her stories. And what happened was I began to connect the dots. And I think a lot of people, uh, this is good advice. You're going to get some stories from some people. I got other stories from my father. And I began to connect the dots and put the family history together. So the, the book is really, the way I look at it, it's kind of Downton Abbey said in Waikiki, because it, docu it documents the right struggle. And, and it's, it's a real reversal of fortune because uh -huh. her uh, grandmother from um, Maui married a very wealthy sea merchant from Italy. And they got married in Maui, and then they moved to Honolulu. He was, I mean, this was a guy who traveled. He was in the Macari Cases Island and met Gauguin and borrowed some of our Gauguin's art way back when so but the the only yeah the only thing was this guy the italian is 42 years old he's in his schooner cruising along the coast of maui he spots my great great grandmother falls in love with her walking on the beach and asks for her hand in marriage she he's 42 and she's 15. um wow there's there's a difference of age you have some photos you want to show us about uh, some of the characters you wrote about, some of the people you wrote about? Well, the photos that I attached are my grandmother on horseback on the property. Yeah. Uh, this one this one is on her property. She has purchased this herself from Sophie Cook, who is a very powerful uh, part of the Judd family who married the, into the Cook family. This was the union of two very powerful Kamaina families, the Judds and the Cooks. Uh -huh. and, and Sophie Cook, Felt bad for my grandmother because my grandmother could only get work as as at cleaning homes. She cleaned homes for a living, and Sophie Cook said, "You know, I can help shape this young woman's future if uh, she buys uh, ahu poa on the east end of Molokai." Uh -huh. And my grandmother was stunned. You know, my grandma. Yeah. She goes, "Now let me see." It be Sophie. It begins at the water and it <laughs> ends where? And Sophie turned and said, "Look at." It ends with a sky meets the mountain. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so she bought this, uh, she bought, but she didn't have the money. And Sophie says, well, how much have you got? How much have you and Shipper saved? And she says, we, we at the very most have $200. How much do you want for it? And Sophie says, well, since you work for me, you clean my homes, you're diligent and a good worker, and I know you're struggling, you can have the whole 250 acres for $3,000. Uh huh. Oh, wow. And so that's where I spent my summers, and that's why I mined the information from my grandmother. Just, you know, as, as you know, it was just very interesting to me, and I never thought I was going to write it down. But years later, I began connecting the dots, and I began to merge those dots with what my father told me, who was a lawyer, who I, I pretty much believed most everything he said. So, uh, I, and so the book is actually, um, uh, a combination of all of those facts all connected. And, and you know, when I, I was recently interviewed and I'm, I've got a kind of a new genre here because I'm, I call it uh, creative nonfiction, but Kamaaina, because in the book, I roll in Kamehameha and what Kamehameha was doing about Molokai. And the reason for that is because Sophie Cook was a avid Kamehameha history fan and told my grandmother, this land you are going to buy was the breadbasket for Kamehameha and his warriors before they assaulted Oahu. 
Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, in fact, the land was so fertile, you could do dry taro. You didn't have to do loys. It was so moist, the soil, you go dry taro on it. Uh huh. Is, so, is the, it still in the family, this land? Yeah, it's still in the family, and it's called Hale Kawai Kapu, which means home of the sacred waters. But it was an incredible struggle because she she made the deal with Sophie Cook alone. This is, you know, he took it, he took the bull in her own hands, and and her husband was working as a cattle driver at uh, Molokai Ranch at the time. And she says, "Guess what? We just bought a property, Ahu Pua, in the east end." He goes, "How the hell are we going to pay that mortgage?" <laughs> and, and Sophie Cook said, "You know, of course, the deal they made." Sophie Cook says, "Give me the two hundred." I'll sell it to you for three thousand dollars. I'll carry the remainder. Pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah, it was a good deal. So they, you know, and so you know, uh, in the closing chapter, it's called Hale Kawai Kapu, where they're on that property, and she goes, "How the hell am I gonna pay that mortgage?" And she goes, "Chipper is gonna have to learn how to scratch out a living, and I'm gonna help him scratch." <laughs> Great. So, so. As luck would have it, there was another ranch on the east end called Uhoku Ranch. This and is Chipper, a Halaba Valley? Yeah, towards the, on the way to Halaba, but it was the high country, you know, on the way. It was probably five to six, seven miles um, east on the way to Halaba Valley, east of her Hale Kaiwai Kapu property. And, and she went to the owner of Uhoku Ranch. He goes, you're crazy. You're crazy, Wahidi. I would never, ever let a woman drive cattle with men. And she <laughs> says, what is it going to take? And she got on her hands and knees. And he says, look, he goes, look, he goes, Julia, I'm going to make you a fence rider. You ride fence for a year. You, you find breaks in that fence line, you repair them. We'll talk again. She did that for a whole year. And he says, you ride with your husband now and you drive cattle. And it was funny, their first uh, drive, they had about 50 head of the nice Charolais cattle, these beautiful white cattle. They drove them from the top of the hills down to Puko Harbor, and he was exhausted. You know, she goes, oh, thank God we're here. And Chipper looks at her and goes, are you insane? We're, we're just beginning. You've got to rope every single head of cattle and drag it out to that sand pan where those two Hawaiian guys are treading water. So she's she's got she goes she tethers the cow and she's pulling it into the water. Her car, her horse is swimming, pulling a swimming cow. <laughs> Where was and, this? Is this when they were loaded on uh, barges or boats to take them to Honolulu? Is this yeah? You got it. You, Harbor? you got it. You got it. And they worked so long and so hard that they actually got into the harvest moon and they relied on the moon and the stars to get back to Puhoku Ranch. And the initial, the initial, uh, they had no home at Hale Kaiwai Kapu and had to save money. And they had to clear the Kiavi forest too before they could live there. So they had they had a stone home that they gave they gave the Paniolos at uh, Puhoku Ranch and that's where they lived for a year. <laughs> and in their spare time, in their spare time, which they didn't have much of, they would go and begin to clear the Kiavi. Uh, yeah, a lot of Kiavi on Molokai. So have you have you been to this land? Have you spent time at this land? Was this a place you went to regularly when you were a kid or what? Oh, yeah, absolutely. As, as I said before, my my mother and father, my mother was East Coast and she never was really good around boys and craziness. And we we're rough and tumble and we we're always fighting. And she was glad to get rid of us every summer. So, you know, and, and grandma was, you know, going to, set the rules and set the discipline, and she did, and gave us chores and so forth. She gave me my first horse when I was four years old. She had a horse wreck. And she gave me this big roan mare to ride, and I said, oh, well, what are, I said, let me take the flash down the beach. She says, go ahead. And I did, I raced flash on the beach. She says, take flash now up the mountain if you want. So I took it up the mountain, which she owned. And then I came back and I said, one more time down the beach. She said, you, you're going to, she called me the little monster. And she said, you know what? You're a little monster. You're going to, you're going to ride that horse flash to death. I, I took her down to the beach. I rode her. She was awesome. 
The next morning, she dropped a full. <laughs> oh yeah! Wow, interesting. Well, I mean, it was all about all about ranching in those days. I, I recall uh, the Cook Ranch yeah. dominated Molokai for yeah. generations, and I suppose the Cook Ranch was the center of life on Molokai in those days, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it really was. I mean, it was called Molokai Ranch, and and Cook, see, his father owned it, and he gave it to George Cook to run. And Sophie, and they had a very nice, they had one of the first swimming pools on the island. Oh, and they interesting. Had a, and they had their kids, and they would bring their send their kids every uh, school year back to Hawaii, Oahu, for education, Honolulu. So they would only visit in the summer. They were quite terrific, though, because they brought a lot of the World War II vets over there for R and R, and you know, try to you know, reacclimate them to normal kind of living and so forth. Mm -hmm. So. My my grandmother's relationship was interesting though with Sophie Cook because my grandmother was a city girl. She had never killed an animal before, and Sophie Cook was quite a hunter. And there were deer and, there, the axis deer, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. So my grandmother says, and Sophie Cook pulls out this huge buck knife after shooting the deer and says, "Now we're going to sit slit its throat." Oh no! Yeah, yeah. And, she could dress a deer. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> slit its throat and then hang it up later and butcher it. Yeah. And my grandmother was absolutely appalled. So what's interesting about this book is that transition from this spoiled city girl at 16 years old and walking through Waikiki looking for male attention to having these two kids out of wedlock. And then she actually went to Molokai chasing after Chipper because they weren't married. They were not married. And she went on the hopes that he would marry her. <laughs> so why did you call her? Uh, the Queen of Molokai. You must have thought about that title and considered that in view of all that you know and all that you wrote. Why did you entitle the book The Queen of Molokai? Well, I called her the Queen of Molokai. This is very strange, but I had developed a short story that won awards called The Queen of Molokai with her at a later state. Uh, I have her during World War II. And some of the effects she had on the island and, and what she did, you know, um, she was she would get on a horse and that horse, I've never seen it, that horse would not just walk or just trot, it would prance. And she had a very interesting relationship with animals and horses. And I consider her like the Queen of Molokai because she was very instrumental. She joined the U.S. Oh, and she put on all of the uh, shows for the uh, vets who are R and R on Molokai. And one of the one of the uh, she discovered a lot of talent over there, and she dressed her girls up like rockets. And she got all of the yeah, she got New York all of style, the, eh? <laughs> right? And the, and you know the women were really meticulous. The mothers they they would get magazines uh, from New York. And they would they would stitch pillbox hats, sequin hats, anything they could, that were similar to the, the style of the 20s. And then, you know, not the 20s, but the 40s. And then they'd bring the girls on stage to dance for the GI. Mm -hmm. where, where, does the, where does the book end, Kirby? I mean, you've covered an awful lot of ground between yeah. early, well, early teens, uh, the 20th century till, till the 40s. Well, how, how far do you go? Well, this is kind of interesting because <laughs> Because that was my end story, where she closes by entertaining the GIs and ends up meeting this handsome uh, lieutenant from the army. And she's tempted, you know, she's married at the time, but also she's upset because Chipper is cheating on local women with local women. So she, she, you know, she goes, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. There was that conflict kind of thing, and that was kind of how I wanted to end it. But guess what? I started in. I only got four years into her life, and I got 300 pages. Oh, wow. So I, I had to, you know, I had to say, wait, I got to end, because I'll have a 1,400-page manuscript. I just want to get book one out. Yeah. So you how, how long is, the, uh, is the, you know, the book now? I mean, the, the final copy. The, the final copy is 300 pages, and it's it's really sad, too, because he leaves her sons, but then I have two chapters set in Kaimaki uh, because of the reversal of fortune. They had this beautiful 
land and property in Palolo Valley that was inherited from her um, her grandmother, and it was lost. They lost everything, and um, they're forced to live in a shanty, not a shanty, but like a two-bedroom house on Ninth Avenue in Kaima Key with one bathroom for about 10 people. And it's, it's very interesting because the she meets an Englishman uh, at a dance in the Moana, and so does her older sister. So the two sisters meet two brothers, two local girls meet two, these, you know, fancy pants English guys. But it just so happens that the uh, older brother who, who falls in love with her older sister get married, but her uh, guy, her English guy, leaves her pregnant and goes to San Francisco. So many, so many interesting human human twists in this. So uh, what was her name, your grandmother? What was her name? Her name was Julia Wright. Yeah, my name is Wright or Julia Wright. Julia that was, Wright. That, yeah, that was her name. And, when did she uh, die? Uh, she died in 1982 on Molokai. Yeah, mm. and this is, this is her on her property that she just bought from Sophie Cook for $200 down. And she's she's never ridden a horse before, but had to learn, and and she learned. You know, she was forced to adapt to that rugged country life. You know, and you know when she got to uh, the West End first, she was at Molokai Ranch, and there's no running water, there's no nothing, there's the yeah. outhouse. She's not used to all that kind of stuff. So, but what's very interesting is she takes her sorrow. And her, her, she's waiting to be married, and her older brother Tommy is saying, "Well, what's what's this guy all about? Is he going to marry you or not? I mean, we've been waiting a year for this, you know, wedding proposal, <laughs> and he he doesn't come through. He's kind of a non-committal Paniolo, but a but a but a decorated vet. He's a he's a you know seven years her senior, but incredibly well decorated and stuff and." But when he comes back from the war, he doesn't know how to fit in. He's a he's was originally a beach boy with the Outerrigger Canoe Club, but all the younger guys are kind of you know taking over and they're taking the tourist women on all their little you know canoe rides and surf lessons and stuff. So he really doesn't know how to fit in. And then he gets the offer from uh, Cook to come over and drive cattle on Molokai Ranch, which he does. And then on top of that. Cook says, I want to make more money. And he goes, well, what do you want? What do you have in mind, George Cook? And he says, I want to raise sheep and not only raise sheep and, and you know, use that for meat or sell it. I want to shear them and I want to send that their their wool to Germany and New York City. And that's what he does. Huh. When, when did they, they chipper now you're talking about? Right, right. So well, they, when they when did he die? How long did he live? Uh, Chipper lived until about 1970. He died. He passed away, you know, 12 years. But they had such a volatile relationship that uh, uh, it came to the point where they divorced. But my grandmother felt bad for him. So she had this big property. And she says, look, I'll give you an, I, I'll give you a life estate. So she gave him a life estate next to this, uh, the corner, one, the eastern boundary of her property, which was distantly separated from her place. And I remember spending a lot of time with them both because she would cook for him occasionally and, and bring, you know, lamb stew over to him and they would talk story on his lanai. And there again, I began piecing together pieces of their history. It's a great job you've done. I mean, it's an important job. It gives us a window into those times. And, um, you know, people who you don't meet, you don't meet people like that today. They are truly a Hawaii phenomenon with all of, the, all of the vectors and all the experiences they had for such a long period of time. Uh, right. It's and then before I, our time, isn't it? Yeah. And then, you know, I, I also wanted to pay homage to hotels that meant a lot to my grandmother. And one of those hotels was, you probably remember it, the Alexander Young Hotel. Oh, sure. And I worked in that yeah. building for many years. I've got major descriptions, and you feel like you're right in the hotel. Yeah. Oh, that's really important to know about this. So, um, so is this published? Uh, can I get it on Amazon? Where can I find the book, Kirby? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon, and it's 
It's with uh, Kindle and also hard copy. And then if you want to buy it earlier, you want to come to my book signing. I've got a great book signing in Coco Marina. And <clears throat> I avoid bookstores. I don't go to bookstores at all. I don't sign it. <laughs> I do not. I sign where it's fun, where people can have fun. And that's why I pick breweries. I sign at breweries. <laughs> breweries. <laughs> and they do have fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can find you can find me at Coca Marina on May 3rd, <laughs> noon to 3. And I've got a classmate coming who is a former Miss USA. Okay. Well, that always brightens <laughs> up a book signing. So yeah, um, I know, I know. Kirby, Kirby, uh, uh, you know, you're living in California. Are you a professional author there? Have you have you done other books? Will you do other books? Where do you fit? I mean, you you talk like an author. That's intended to be a compliment. Um, but have you done others? Will you do others? Uh, and what will they be like? Well, I have actually. I've written thirteen books. I graduated from San Francisco State University. I studied with Francis Mays, who wrote Under the Tuscan Sun. I also studied with Anne Rice, who wrote the uh, Vampire Books. Ah. Yeah, you think, so, you think the uh, you think the uh, this book, the Queen of Molokai, could ever be a movie? After all, we did the Descendants, right? You know about that. That was one of those yeah. thousand Hawaii stories that that made it to Hollywood. But here's another, right. clearly a story that could be uh, that could make it to Hollywood. Do you have any thoughts about that? Is any discussion about that? Yeah, I do. And as a matter of fact, I'm trying to get uh, my cousin who is in. Uh, was in Hollywood for a little while. He was with Baywatch, Kalai Miller, and I'm trying to get him interested in maybe playing one of the lead roles. I do not see it as a movie. I see it as a series. I see it as a Downton Abbey set in Waikiki. <laughs> got it. Got it. So uh, let me, maybe on PBS. But let me ask you one last question before we go, Kirby. Um, you are so steep in this important period of Hawaii history and these really larger than life people you've described. Um, and it all happened, really, it all happened here. So why are you not here, Kirby? Why are you not living in Hawaii? This is strange. OK, I'm going to make a confession. I have found that, I don't know if any other writer has experienced this, but I write better about Hawaii being away from it because the agony of the loss of not being there makes me a stronger writer. Oh, what a wonderful statement to make. Thank you, Kirby Wright. It's really wonderful to talk to you. I'm so glad we connected today. I wish you well yeah. in the book, and I hope we can connect again. Kirby Wright, yeah, I'm gonna, Are you coming to my book signing in Coca Marina? I hope so. I hope so. Okay. You'll send me an invitation. You have my contact. I got it, man. Thank, I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Kirby. Kirby Wright, the author of The Queen of Molokai about his grandmother. What a wonderful discussion. Aloha. Aloha, man. Thanks so much.